This is the second in a webinar series that SDSN, SDSN Amazonia, and Geopark Quadrilatero uh, have been organizing about mining in the SDGs, and we're so happy to have you all with us today. Today, we're going to look at regulations and strategic guidelines that can be implemented to improve territorial governance frameworks and the mining chain. It will emphasize proper dialogue and communication between local communities, external stakeholders, mining representatives, and governmental authorities. The group will also discuss the definition of what sustainable is when talking about a mining territory or community. We have four fabulous speakers with us today. First, we'll hear from Renato Simonelli. He is president of Geopark Quadrilatero, which is a member of SDSN, and he's also co-chair of this group organizing webinar series and our online collaborative platform for talking about the SDGs and mining. We have a collaborative platform on uh, the website Mobilize, and everyone who's uh, participating in this webinar, after we disconnect, you'll get a recording of the webinar as well as an invitation to join that platform. Uh, his area of expertise specifically is innovation and mining territories. After uh, Renato Simonelli, we'll hear from Dr. Kieran Moffat. He's a social and organizational psychologist and the CEO and co-founder of Volconic, a data science and community engagement company created in 2019. Built on a platform of science, he developed over a decade at CSIRO, Australia's National Science Agency. Then we'll hear from Rolf George Fux, who's got over 20 years of experience in large companies and coordinating the areas of public and community affairs and social responsibility. Since 2001, he's acted as a consultant focused on social and sustainability issues, mainly in the industrial sector. And he's a founding partner and president of Integratio, a pioneer and one of the most recognized Brazilian consultancy groups on ESG and the social license to operate. And then finally, we'll close out our panel with Giorgio de Tomi, a mining engineer with a degree from the University of Sao Paulo and a PhD from the Imperial College and a Master's of Science from Southern Illinois University. He heads the US Peace Center for Responsible Mining and is the professor of mining at the University of Sao Paulo. And he's also a fellow of IOM3 and has a degree in engineering from the UK and acts as the mining QP and CP for numerous enterprises worldwide. So without any further ado, I'll ask uh, Renato to please go ahead and connect his camera and share his slides. Uh, we will start it off with him. And while he works on that, I will remind everyone, we will have opportunity for Q&A at the end of the presentations. If you would like to ask a question, feel free to raise your hand. We will call on you and give you the opportunity to connect your camera, your microphone and or your camera if you so choose, uh, if we can see your face to ask your question. We're gonna hold all the questions until the end after all four presentations. Renato, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Lauren. Well, welcome to all the audience for to be here with us. We hope that you can participate by sending messages, sending questions. Uh, this is the second, as, as, as Laura introduced you, Strategic Guidelines for Sustainable Mining Territories is the second uh, webinar of a series uh, within SDSN and the platform Visions to SDG in Mining Territories. Uh, I'm very happy to be here with Kieran, Giorgio, and Rolf. Uh, Kieran, we have been we have worked maybe by 2010, let's say at the time, attempting to bring life, social life to operate to Brazil. Uh, we at that time was there was no no clear clear evidence of the need for that, but I understand that now is the time. And so, and Kieran has representatives in Brazil. She, he eventually will talk about that. George de Tommy and Rolf, we, we are colleagues at Brazil Mineral Magazine, and it will be very interesting to share our, our views. Well, my idea of the presentation is that I'll be in each slide presenting uh, arguments, challenges, and proposals that could be used in the, 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 the work to develop guidelines that could uh, support the, the sustainability of mining territory. The, 
the first concept, geographic perimeter of a mining territory, is a very base guideline focus and also governance priority for agreement. We, as, as you go through the, the, the presentation, it's very clear. If you are looking for sustainability of the mining territory, certainly you need to create a governance. So the, the guidelines are needed as a, as, a, as a basic requirement, but at the same time as the governance uh, is, is organized and start to, to function, uh, certainly, the, 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 this governance, we have to agree what's really the concept or the definition to be used for, for mining territory. Tentatively, just a minute here. Tentatively, the geographic perimeter of a mining territory considers the operational areas of the local mines and their logistic, hydric, social, environmental, economic, and support related extensions. So, it's much more complex. What's, what's considered to be the mining territory. And it's this governance, local governance, that will then uh, agree what should be the concept to be validated. Also, another point, what are the, the scopes that in some way counters the, the need for strategic guidelines, okay? So the guidelines general scope to be economic, social, environmental, and sustainable development of mining territories, empower of local populations, competitiveness and growth of local business, generation of income and jobs, resolution of conflicts, mining territory. So this is the, 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 the whole area of, of, of topics of teams that we will be looking for, establish what will be our priority for new guidelines. Uh, also, we can start by what the, the inaugurating members of the platform in 2021, when the platform Vision to SDG Mine was, was formed, they established already some challenge that could be transformed into, into guidelines. Just a minute. So, So the, the platform at that time, in May of 2021, they established the, the following challenge that could be, be again transformed into proposal of, of guidelines. What's the definition of sustainable mining? This is a very common uh, proposal, it's a very common term. And we have to really discuss if this term is, is, is correct, is applicable, and how it relates to the, the mining territory. But in a sense, this is the, the main focus, the main target is to have a sustainable mining territory. Stakeholders communication, stakeholders dialogue. Industry stakeholders communication, dialogue and col collaboration since exploration and the early stage of the mining project. It's very common that, that the ter territorial actors, they only enter in, 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 the, in the, the engagement or in the dialogue process eventually when the, the project, the mining project is already very advanced. To integrate local mining ecosystems, to promote knowledge exchange between mining territories. So we understand that the many mining territories that have around the world, either in Brazil or around the world, they can exchange between them experience, proposals, and, and, and clues to really reach their objectives. And finally, in this slide, mining and long-term local development. It's interesting that there is a difficulty in culture to, 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 to develop, to, go, to govern uh, long-term local developments. The other slides in the same concept. In the rural areas where mining takes place, there is a lack of infrastructure and skilled labor. How do communities recover from mining disasters? How do you deal with mine closure? what happens to the environment and the community. And again, looking at this, this, these questions are mainly important for who is in the territory, okay? There is a, a, a very intense knowledge at the mining uh, sector, but again, there is a lack of, of experience, of knowledge, of methodology at the size of the uh, uh, territorial actors. Communities may not have the education to effectively engage. 
investors and com companies may not understand local realities or how to engage with communities and understand their value and customs. Education is needed for better communication, dialogue, transparency. Again, all these points certainly will converge to, to, to propose of guidelines. Since we are talking about in this, the, this webinar is proposed to be uh, focused on, on the whole universe of mines and mining territories. We come to, we bring here the International Council of Mining and Metals as a reference for, for the mining industries globally. I see MM have a set of mining principles as a reference for the global mining industry. And we can say that the best environmental, social and governance practice established by the ICMM for, followed 38 performance expectations and eight position statements. You can look at this, uh, this 38 performance expectations, eight position statements in more detail at the site of ICMM. And at the site, at the definition of the 38 performance expectations, we can understand that they are aligned to the SDGs and the Paris Agreements for Climate Change. However, Sustainable mining territory are not a clear target for ICMM, but we can understand that the synergies ESG applied to industry with SDGs applied to territory are more evident this, this association, this alignment to ICMM principles. And you understand at this point, again, we have a very uh, uh, sharp proposal for future guidelines. Uh, we can say, this is a figure that I have been using a lot, is that if we, we look at this SDG 8, 17 goals, at the same time, the, the many operations at the mining uh, sector, okay, at the productive chain uh, that define the SDG focus, we can say that if we align, if we, if we, uh, we get closer these two uh, these two objectives, SDG, ES, SDG and ESG, certainly will, let's say, make faster the, the reach of the sustainability. Again, following, uh, we may say that mining territories are not aligned fully for sustainability. It's expected from the ICMM principles and the current mining attitudes that in the current decade, the mining sector will show remarkable improvements in the current sustainability indicators. The same optimism is not expected to the sustainability of mining territory and the empower of local communities and the stakeholders. What's more important about this difference in timing is that mining territories not adequately addressed by the industry may become an impediment to improvement of sustainability indicators at the mining sector. So it's very important that the mining companies understand that if they want to reach uh, full uh, access to their expectations of sustainability, they have to engage the territory actors. Otherwise, there is an impediment for more advancement of the mining industry. At the end, guidelines and recommendations to the mining territories share with mining companies and governments may be seen as a priority target by the platform. So we understand that as we develop the guidelines, for the territory, okay? We have to be uh, uh, communicating these guidelines to the mining companies and the government that will certainly catalyze or induce a more fast uh, development of the mining territories. Another point related to mining territories is how to empower mining territories for improvement in sustainability. I have a set of seven uh, subjects. First one is to educate stakeholders for mining territory difference and conflicts of culture. We are talking completely difference in culture from mining sector and territorial actors. So we have to make an effort so that the difference in culture may be better managed. We are not saying that the, the culture, the difference culture won't, won't be there, but we have to say that we have to, 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 to make that this, this difference in culture be more friend. Okay, that they, they work together more friendly. Second, to assess territorial values periodically, social, economic, environmental, and cultural. So we have to assess periodically what have been the results of the efforts from all the sides, from all the actors in terms of developing the, 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 the mining territory. Third is how to, how to, uh, to assess periodically the SDGs in the territory. 
Fourth, to mobilize and engage the communities, stakeholders, private sector, government agents in proper system of communication. So communication is very important if you want to reach really collaboration between all these sectors. Fifth, to articulate alliances and partnerships. That will be in fact the 70, uh, 70th uh, uh, SDG in the, the list of the 70s. Sixty, to empower local leaderships. And seventh, to conceive and plan a sustainable development governance, renew each 10 years time. So in our, in our understanding, 10 years time could be the unit of time to have an a, 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 a important sustainable development governance, okay? So uh, we have to understand that this is a long-term project, okay? Change culture to engage the, the, the actors and to really make collaboration between the actors, this takes time. Uh, I see a lot of, of, of mining territories, I see a lot of mining companies, they, 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 they give up after maybe four years or less because they think that they will never succeed. That, that's not right, okay? Because we know in advance that a long time will be required for success. And we can say that the question how to empower mining territories for improvement sustainability converge to a proposal of protocol of communication, engagement, governance for mining territories. So a protocol will be already a proposal of guidelines. And, and these we can either uh, benchmark all the mining territories or the system, the mining territory, mining sector, or we can use fundamentals to develop the proper uh, proposal protocol for the specific case. And finally, as a case, uh, we established using post mine economic uh, development or to use the economic development as part of the mining closure process as a case. How we are going to apply all this, uh, this uh, uh, inserted challenges and proposals uh, to really uh, succeed in a post mine economic de development. We have some premises for that. First one is to adopt the concept of just transition. The second one is to address full diversity of the population in a way that nobody is to be forgotten in the development, in, in engaging all the diversity in this post mine economic development. To address micro to large business segments. So it's very, common that the municipalities, they want just medium to large business to diversify the economy as, after the mine has gone. And that's not the case. We have from micro to individual uh, uh, business to large business segments. Proper culture and need of continuity in long-term planning as a crucial of programs. In, in, in communities, in territories, and mining companies that doesn't understand this need for long-term uh, development, certainly this is going to be a challenge. We need to start the planning and the execution of a program of diversification of economic development post mine to be long, to be a long-term process. And in terms of, of the main challenges, specific challenges, we may say that one is di diagnosis of past, current, and reclaiming scenarios, events, and impacts. We have the governance has to be following these steps have to understand in a good view, in a big view, what's going on, okay? In one year, three years, five years, 10 years, and more. Uh, the third, second one is mobilization of required resource, institutional frameworks, timing, and governance. So we need to mobilize all these resources in order to be, to be successful. Other one is planning. Some countries, some communities, uh, some systems mining territory, uh, they are not using to plan. They're just developed by intuition or they develop by the, the priority of the mining sector or the priority of the, the territorial sector. And again, we say that we have to align, we have to combine ESG and SDG in a way to really uh, make successful. So that, okay, you have the individual, individual priorities, territorial or mining, but at the same time, we need to identify common goals between these two systems. Fourth one is governance, organization, and operation. Certainly we need to, 
And coming back from, from what we have been discussed about ICMM, okay, for the, for the mining industry, they already have been working uh, with their, their teams and for, for a long time, but that's not the case, okay? We have, we have to make them to work together in a governance system so that we could have the, the communities, the governments, the mining companies, each of the mining sector, because we have many operations and many process within the mining sector. So we have to find a way in a governance system to put all these together and others that eventually people may, may collaborate in the following slides. Well, okay, with- I'm our, gonna ask you to wrap up. Okay, well, main, a closing correction, a collection of proposed guidelines. We have subjects raised by member of the CSDSN, Platform Visions to SDG Mining Territory, the general scope for the guidance, to improve communication and dialogue among mine and territory actors, new cultures, to explore synergies, ESG, SDG, to improve sustainability indicators, protocol of communication in direction to a governance structure to the mining territory system, and finding mining closure, economic development as a case under just transition agenda and diversity. And these are my contacts in case someone wants to proceed with the discussion on this topic. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Renato. Uh, without any further ado, we'll turn to our next speaker, Dr. Karen Moffitt. And thank you so much to everybody who is introducing yourself in the chat. If you haven't done so already, please feel free to do so. It's great to see where everybody's joining us from. Thanks very much. Uh, and can I just confirm that slide Slides is look great. up? <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Excellent. Thanks. And uh, hi, everybody. Uh, Kieran Moffat here from Brisbane, Australia, but uh, also on the line, and Alicia Santiago, who's based in Sao Paulo, works um, for Vaconic and, and leads our Latin American operations as well. So welcome to her as well. Um, excellent to be working with you again, Renato, and thank you for the invitation. Um, really great presentation and uh, great segue into what, what I'll be speaking about today, which is um, the integration of SDGs, ESG, as two sets of, of principles and, and frameworks, how they relate to each other um, and to social license to operate as a family of concepts, um, and then really trying to get quite specific about uh, the way that we work with, with companies to, to inform uh, how they approach uh, SDGs, sustainable um, uh, business practices and, and how they may be rewarded uh, and, and grow as a, as, a, as a result of differentiating themselves through, through that sustainable activity. Um, so I first want to start there with a really brief story. When I was working at CSIRO, Australia's National Science Agency, um, I found it really difficult to recruit social scientists to come and work um, uh, with me. I didn't take it personally, uh, but, uh, but what they would say is that actually we, we find it difficult um, to work in, in the mining industry. Um, uh, we want to work on, on big, meaty issues and feel like the, the mining industry might be a, a part of those, uh, a part of the problem. Um, uh, but actually, what I would always say to them is that mining sits at the centre of uh, so many of the great human challenges of our time uh, and, uh, and that, that working in the mining industry and with the mining industry offers an opportunity um, to help um, uh, those uh, really significant large companies and industries and government in those spaces um, to think about those issues in new ways. Um, and that's certainly what we've been doing in, in the work uh, uh, that we did in CSIRO and, and now in Vaconic. Um, and when I think about SDGs, I, I immediately thought of this report from, from 2020 from Responsible Mining Foundation, Columbia Center on Sustainable Investment. Um, uh, they did a really excellent review of uh, the performance of um, uh, 38 um, companies in the mining industry um, against uh, the, social, uh, the, the SDGs, um, given at that time uh, there was only 10 years left until um, uh, those goals uh, needed to be achieved, now eight years. Um, and what you know, they really uh, said very clearly is that the SDGs provide this framework through which um, companies can demonstrate via their integration and reporting activities that they're managing 
the full range of economic, environmental, social and governance issues in a responsible manner. Um, and, uh, and I think that's a really key statement here, um, in, in particularly in light of the next slide I'll, I'll show you, but, but that, that reporting is not action, that, that what we need to be thinking about very clearly is how we're demonstrating um, that we in the industry are working tangibly and productively and constructively towards the sustainable development goals um, and bringing uh, uh, that thinking um, that underpins the SDGs into core business practices uh, within the companies uh, of, the, of the mining industry. Um, now in their review, um, 38 geographically dispersed large scale mining companies um, accounting for close to 30% of the global value of mining production. So you can kind of guess what, what companies they are. Um, uh, what they found is that many companies are paying real attention to and doing good work on the SDGs and their role in achieving them. Um, and in fact, a few were doing really excellent work integrating them into their, their core business. However, it was only a few companies that were doing really well in that space, because mostly what they found um, is that companies were, were simply um, uh, cosmetically demonstrating how the work that they were already doing and planning to do was mapping against the SDGs. So rather than thinking about the SDGs driving their activities, they were thinking about how to demonstrate that their activities were mapped to the SDGs, and those things are are quite different. So um, uh, the chief criticisms of, of uh, or areas where the mining industry could improve are around going beyond simple mapping of SDGs to ESG issues that they deemed, they deemed to be material. That's really important. I'll come back to that later. Secondly, that the prioritization um, so what they were focusing on was often quite superficial. And, and we see this in criticisms of sustainability reporting, that there are nice stories in there, um, but they're cherry picking um, uh, 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 activities um, that look good rather than make um, substantial progress towards um, those SDGs. <clears throat> and as I said, that was really sort of cosmetic reporting and reporting to be selective. Um, and in fact, what we, um, we found uh, when we did a piece of work with the ICMM on community resilience in the context of COVID-19, we found something quite similar, that companies were very comfortable working on those things that were close to their core business, like economic development within the local communities that they worked alongside. But that isn't the whole story when it comes to resilience, just like the things that companies are focusing on in the SDG space isn't um, the whole uh, the whole gamut of uh, of issues that they need to be working on to achieve those goals. So, for example, um, this report really uh, uh, pulled out the fact that uh, community well-being was something that companies talked about quite a lot, um, but in fact were making uh, quite minor progress towards improving at scales that were going to make a difference in achieving the SDGs. This isn't to say that um, companies are not wanting to do this, but often what we see is the context within which industry operates is not facilitating um, their investment in those, uh, in those, in those areas. Um, and that's often for two reasons. One, the market doesn't reward those behaviors. Um, that the market that allows them to access capital um, uh, and uh, rewards them with lower risk ratings isn't seeing the work that they're doing or, or isn't showing that they will reward um, that would work in the SDG space. Um, and, uh, and so um, that really helps us to, to move into this second space, which is around ESG performance tracking, the area um, that companies are, are really embracing now because markets are also embracing uh, this way of understanding company performance. Um, and what's really exciting about this space is for me as a social scientist, as a social researcher, as somebody who sees um, the real value in bringing community, bringing society into the center of the way we think about um, the mining industry and the benefits it can deliver, not only at local scales, but at societal scales and being part of the challenges that we face um, uh, as a larger human community, um, that social features really prominently as a pillar in the ESG performance space. But what's really interesting in this space is that um, for most of these, uh, of these topics, there are really quite clear, accepted, objective ways of understanding company performance um, uh, 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 to, to then reward uh, by markets. But the one area that really remains 
a very underdeveloped and less mature is around um, uh, understanding and demonstrating effectiveness in, the, in community relations, um, and in particular, managing social risk. Now, when I think about S uh, ESG, um, and its parallels with the area of research that I've really focused on in my career, which is social license to operate, I start thinking, well, maybe um, what we need to be doing is thinking not about um, community relations as part of the suite of metrics that uh, we judge a company by um, as a starting point, but in fact, um, uh, evaluating company performance through the perspective on each of these dimensions, through the eyes of community members, through those people who are receiving um, uh, company activities or on the other end of company activities in each of these um, different spaces. And not only is that uh, 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 an indicator of um, of the extent to which a company holds a strong social license to operate. That if you do community relations well at local and larger scales, you will have a stronger social license to operate. But it also allows companies to look at these issues of community relations through a risk lens. Um, and that, of course, is the language of mining companies. That is co language that allows mining companies to pay attention to these issues in real tangible, constructive ways, um, using a language that they understand, that markets understand, but also um, to do, what's really required there is to do that in a way um, that, that brings community into that conversation. And that's what really we've been focusing on um, uh, in, in our work. So <clears throat> together, what we have is SDGs, ESG, and social license to operate. This is really a family of concepts that are complementary in their nature. Um, and uh, they all require, a, one, a collaborative effort from companies, markets and government to reward and encourage good company practices. There has to be something in it for companies. And I know that the business case for operating in a sustainable way has been made very clearly, but it's hard to change the way a company thinks and acts in these spaces without um, a good economic um, uh, or risk-based way of, of driving new uh, activities, behaviours and ways of understanding these issues. Um, and the second issue I want to I want to pick up on here is that what I think is uh, is really missing. What I think will help in terms of that review that was done around company activity on SDGs is to look at the issue through the lens of risk, i.e., from the perspective of that state that set of stakeholders who represent risk um, to uh, to mining uh, companies, which is which is the communities they operate alongside. What we know from our research and what we've written a lot about is that when communities um, do not have a constructive, productive way to, to have a conversation with companies that are operating alongside them to address the issues they have in their experience of living alongside large scale mining, they will find creative um, and, uh, and anti antagonistic ways to address their concerns. <clears throat> that is a fact that we have seen over and over. And in fact, um, uh, what we now see, and this is where I think um, the topic of this uh, of this conversation is really uh, really comes to the fore, um, is that the the governments are really paying attention to um, that risk as well. And what we've seen uh, just uh, just across the border from from where you are today, Renato, um, in Chile, is four major operations, uh, four major proposed mines in Chile have been rejected by a government there, um, in large part because of uh, the social pushback. Um, uh, around the development of those operations. So what I want to focus on now are three things that I think are really important in helping to, um, to bring the SDGs to life and allow companies to, to switch their focus from reporting against the SDGs to driving behaviour through and towards the SDGs. So one is robust social data built on science. The second is tracking data across time to be able to see how things change and reward companies for doing better. And the third is making that good performance visible um, to a range of actors that are important in this space. So first, kicking off here, um, this is the product of what we, uh, what we do in our work, which is a, uh, called a path analysis. We bring the voice of community inside companies through using surveys 
and doing really sophisticated statistical analysis of that survey is not, un, not only to understand what community think about a company, but why they think that way. And what you're looking at here is effectively the recipe for social license for one of the companies that we work with in a local operation. Um, and what this, uh, what this modeling tells us is the relative strengths of each of the experiences and expectations here on the left-hand side in predicting acceptance or social license to operate of a project on the right-hand side. What we can also see is that trust sits very centrally in this equation, in the relationship between a company um, and, the, and the community's acceptance of an operation. Um, and when you read around the social, uh, when uh, read around the sustainable development goals, the theme of trust is very strong. And it's strong in this work, which is really trying to understand social license as well. Again, demonstrating that these are a family of, of concepts. What we can also do with this work is show that not only, for example, um, is it that environmental impacts um, negatively affect trust and acceptance of a project, so detract the more severe the impacts that are experienced by local community members, the less trust they have in a company and the less they accept a project, i.e. the higher the risk of rejection of a project in a local context, but we can also tease apart on exactly which dimensions of environmental impact um, our community most concerned and, and which of those areas are most important or material to trust and acceptance. And so in using uh, methods like this, we're able to reverse engineer the materiality, materiality discussion where companies are often imposing their view of what is material in their relationships onto community to manage this social risk. When in fact, what we're doing here is from the ground up working with community um, and then using these sophisticated techniques to derive and understand what is in fact material to the relationship between a company and the communities that they operate alongside. So our first principle here is building robust social data built on a platform of science. And so that everybody that's looking at this data has faith and trust in, in the data itself, in what we're producing here, that this is tangible and robust. The second concept that I wanted to pick up on here <clears throat> is that it's really critical that companies have feedback um, in real time um, as to whether the, the, the activities that they're conducting locally to manage their social risk to improve their community relations are actually having a positive effect on their community relations. Now, this may sound simple, but in fact is really fundamental for markets to then be able to, um, to see um, and to reward uh, uh, that, that great community relations activity. And so we want to see at these points, what is it that the company was doing to improve trust within community so that that company can replicate that activity in lots of other places as well. And then the third and final area that I think is really important here is making that good performance visible. So what you're seeing here is a snapshot from the dashboards that we provide to our uh, customers that allow them to demonstrate to other parts of the business in a language that they understand um, where in fact the relationship is, is most important to be focusing on. And I've circled up here regulations because this is really critical, community confidence in the regulatory environment in which a, a, a mining company operates is fundamental to improving trust in a company, demonstrating to both the company and also to government that they are in this together, that achieving the SDGs, that achieving a social license is something that they need to work on together and collaboratively. Um, we also work on, on closing the loop back to community because it's really critical that we provide transparency around this, that if we're going to be telling markets and investors um, uh, and risk rating agencies uh, and insurance companies that we're doing a good job, we also need to be showing community um, the nature of the relationship and the things that we're focusing on, reflecting their own voice back to them, something we found to be really important in building stronger relationships with local communities. So that, and this is my last slide, we use the language of companies to understand and drive better social performance within companies that is robust, defendable, is transparent and visible to those that will reward that behaviour, i.e. markets, and show governments that it's also in their best interest to support and reward companies that are working meaningfully to achieve the SDGs, perhaps in that region-wide um, type structure 
that Renato was just describing to us uh, previously. Thanks so much and I look forward to, to uh, getting into some discussion later. Wonderful, thank you so much, Kieran. Um, well, I won't add to the time by uh, and take it away from the discussion. We'll go ahead and turn to our next speaker, Rolf George Fuchs. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, everyone, and uh, for the attendance. And thank a lot to Renato and Kieran for the good and comprehensive presentations. I will try to share my screen. That looks great. Yeah, fine. So uh, it's a very, very fantastic team that I have. And uh, I will try to complement a little bit what Renato and Kirin already presented with a deeper focus on the human side, the community side, and the perspective of the community, like you said. Um, but my page is not changing. Let's try it again. Um, and if it still doesn't work, I'm happy to run your slides for you. Yeah. So just a short Perfect. view <laughs> about it. Yeah, about Integratio, we are, have a strong presence in whole Brazil and expanding to South America now. And uh, like you said in the beginning, Lauren, our focus is, uh, is the social management, community management and all this, yeah. Our goal today is uh, integrated territory management. Uh, I, like I said, I will, I will try to to go a little bit deeper in this. Uh, to achieve this, uh, this goal, we, we need to recognize motivations. Why do people act? The community perspective. And of course, each person acts to defend or meet interests and needs. Uh, so the way is to converge common needs and interests to achieve an integrated approach. Uh, but a lot of examples that this doesn't work in every place. On the left, you have a map with conflicts in, uh, without environmental justice, social environmental justice in the world. And so a lot of other examples I have, but uh, like Renato said, a lot of companies gave up or, or are on hold with projects in over the last 10 years in South America are estimated more than 35 US billion dollars of investments cancelled or on hold. Um, and a lot of, of examples, some of you know this one or other case. Um, in Brazil, we have a large number of projects that uh, <clears throat> live on conflict and uh, some of them, like Renato said, gave up. Um, but why do we look for this? Uh, we in Tegaccio work to make viable this, this projects and, uh, and managing these conflicts or anticipating we prefer to work before the, 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 the conflicts rise, of course. Um, so the social license to operate is a necessity, uh, but this means mutual understanding. ESG and implementation of SDGs is the way for this. I think that's clear after this other both good presentations, but to achieve this, we need to understand no community relation is possible if there is not understanding of the community and uh, a lot of uh, a large number of community uh, of companies uh, speak their own language don't understand enough 
uh, or try to understand in a not technical scientific basis. Uh, understand the territory, the environment, the histo uh, history, the needs, the education level, the perceptions of the culture. Uh, we developed a technology or a, or a, a tool for this uh, to, because this is a, a good assessment, social environmental assessment can say this to you, but you need to build a good prognosis, look to the future, to permit integrated territory management and social and economic development. Uh, so we have to understand better the most important company uh, component of a territory, the people. And uh, so we we work uh, internally with five dimensions of hu human actions. Uh, like a shell, we have only five basic uh, families of uh, feelings or actions uh, uh, that motivate. Uh, persons and communities to act. So uh, the territory is first uh, achieve basic needs, the property, space domain, hierarchy, influence, and the need to be respected. That's the basic and first need from each human is to be respected. And if we don't uh, act with with the uh, good and 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 first of all respect, we it's the first step to to close a, a project or a company. Ideology is believe in is religion, a dogma, sectarism, discrimination. We have to understand the ideology that motivates this people. The advantage is to gain advantage to provide advantage for others or to seek advantage for all. And the fourth one is the emotion. Hate, joy, indifference, sadnesses. Uh, a lot of, I look at, at Google and uh, more than 170 different uh, emotions are listed and uh, that people can feel. So we have to understand this. And uh, the show on over this four is the culture. The local culture has to be understand, uh, understood. Ursula Burns uh, defined for me the best definition of culture is people plus history. And uh, so with this five um, uh, motivations, we can understand the primary motivation and the secondary motivation of a person, a group, uh, a, a whole community. And with this, with this understanding, we can go ahead. So uh, this helps us a lot to understand primary and secondary motivation forces for individuals, groups. And so we can address approaches, dialogue, and plant seeds for the understanding and mutual construction of a better future. Uh, Shortly, very shortly, as it is. You gave me f uh, fifteen minutes, and I yes, you were our first oh, panelist to uh, finish five. on time, which I appreciate as your moderator. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Plus, it'll leave more time for the discussion. So, before we yeah, turn and to for, our final and for, the, for and for Giorgio, yes. Uh, before I yield the floor to our finer speak or final speaker, uh, Giorgio Detomi, I just want to remind everyone, um, I see some of you are using the Q&A option at the bottom of Zoom. That is great, especially if you have a quick question for uh, our panel. But in the discussion portion after Giorgio speaks, um, we're actually going to yield the floor to the participants to ask their questions live. So if you're interested in that, use the raise hand feature at the bottom of Zoom to raise your virtual hand, and I will call on everybody one by one um, after Giorgio Dottomi's presentation.
presentation when the Q&A starts. Um, so just a reminder, if you want to ask your question on screen, please feel free to raise your hand. Uh, and if you're shy, you can type it in and I will read it out. Uh, Georgia, the floor is yours, please. Okay, hi, uh, hello everybody. Good morning, I live here in Brazil. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll complement the brilliant presentations we had uh, just now with a view of ESG for small scale mining. Okay, as, as you know, small scale mining is becoming more and more an important issue in the mining sector. And of course, ESG affects that as well. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that, okay? So a little bit about the mine value chain, uh, the 2030 agenda, a little bit about this discussion of uh, sustainable development, but uh, focused on, on small scale mining, and a little bit about how to go about it, how, how I believe we can make progress on that, okay? First of all, the mine value chain. Well, uh, you guys know how it works. It starts with mineral exploration, then we do mine planning. Then we go on to engineering studies so we can progress to, to implementation and construction. And finally, we come to operation. After operation, it's our duty to do the mine closure. closure. And that's it for the mine value chain, right? No, it's not right. We still have another step forward, which is the post closure. Oh, sorry, but mining it's over and I'm, I closed the mine. I have nothing else to do, but it's precisely what the previous speakers were talking about. It's about future use. So we, we need to get involved. We as mining, as the mining sector, we need to get involved in the post closure as well. Okay, so it's not about only the during, the, the during mining. Okay, we have all the commitments and agreements and relationships going before and after mining, okay? So when we talk about, you know, the technical view of it, we have the mine planning, life of mine, that we, we look at the life of the mine from the beginning to the end of the mining cycle, right? But then what happens? This is uh, uh, the, the, the relationship with the territory and the communities goes, goes beyond, beyond when you finish mining. So that is why we need to do the mine closure plan. But wait, right at the beginning, I don't even have a mine yet and I'm already closing it precisely. That is the idea, is to have the whole view from the beginning, okay? So you can go all the way after mining to the commissioning, managing the, the social trans, social economical uh, transition and then monitoring and future use. So when we talk about the mine value chain, it includes not only the during, but also the before and the after mining. And that is the concept of ESG. ESG, it doesn't take place only after mining or only during mine closure, is the, uh, during the whole value, value chain. And as Kieran said, there is a, this ESG concept or agenda includes a family of other concepts. They all go together. ESG, social license to, to operate, the SDGs and decarbonation, it all goes together, okay? Well, you all know the, the, the SDGs, okay? 17 objectives with all the targets, it's already there. And the motto is no one, leave no one behind. That's beautiful. But being the mining sector, what did we do? Oh, United Nations, thank you very much. This is fantastic. But, but I know it apply, applies to all the, the industry and all sectors and so on. But mining is different. Mining is more complicated. You know, you should understand this. And look what happened. One year after the publication of the 2030 agenda, in 2016, we got a, a, a document from the United Nations as well, mapping mining to the SDGs. So no more excuses. Each one, the SDGs has have all the has all the, 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 the targets and the actions related to the mining activity, where the mining industry or mining sector can contribute to each one of those SDGs. 
This is a beautiful document. It's published in many languages, easy to access, okay? But then next step, what happened? Oh, okay, United Nations, thank you for the SDGs. Thank you for mapping SDGs for, for mining, but we are small scale mining. We are a different sector. We have a lot of restrictions with, with resources and it's very difficult. So, well, this applies well to large scale mining, but not small scale mining, sorry. So some, there, was, there was a new player that came into the game to address that issue. You know, who is this? This player? My friends, it's the World Bank. The World Bank came in to discuss small scale mining and the application of SDG to small scale mining. That's beautiful because it means that the, the small scale mining sector is crucial, is critical for our society. So the World Bank came in and complemented the work from the United Nations and selected nine SDGs that are priority for small scale mining. And it's a beautiful document as well, because I mean, it simplifies the issue. So you, okay, you have 17 SDGs, but you as small scale mining, you can start with nine of them and prioritize, pri start prioritizing those nine SDGs. Quick example for you guys, gender equality, very simple. Here in Brazil, only the, the work, workforce in small scale mining, according to a recent uh, 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 work done by the, the Ministry of Mines, is only 6% of the workforce is women. So it's very simple to, to change that, right? Another, another example is, is the, the job creation, right? Job creation is a big uh, like, uh, issue for small-scale mining because we, take, uh, we, we offer jobs where people don't have many options. And these jobs are specialized and non-specialized. So it helps a lot the local communities. And finally, you know, like strong institutions and, and uh, having small scale mining contributing to regional uh, uh, integration. That's a very important role for small scale mining and the, the, the my, small scale mining sector should understand that. So what happens? This motto of uh, the uh, 2030 agenda, which is leave no one behind, has a lot to do with, with small scale mining. So we have to understand that. And, and, and the, the small scale mining operators and, and uh, the sector in general must understand that and must take this very, very seriously into, into account, okay? I saw this presentation you know, during the pandemic from the University of Delaware. They have lots of work. They do a lots of work on, on sustainable mining. And th this statement, I find it very strong, okay? There is no sustainable development without uh, responsible mining, right? Because we love to use our mobile phones. We love to go into, you know, using technology and so on. And for that, we need minerals. This is a list of critical minerals from Canada for the 21st century. And many of them, as you can see, manganese, tantalum, tin, tungsten, they all come from small-scale mining, almost exclusively from small-scale mining. So we need to sort out small-scale mining. We need to sort out the ESG issue in small-scale mining, because if we don't do that, we'll have difficulties to obtain the targets of sustainable development in this century, okay? Especially if we take into account our targets to get to carbon neutrality into 2050. Okay, so it's very important we, we understand that and we understand the role of small scale mining. In terms of mining, the mining sector in general, uh, Ernest Young did this, uh, 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 it's a research project in which they interviewed lots of uh, mining executives and mining operates around the world in, in, in finding out what is the top issue, top risk, top issue, top challenge in the mining sector. And it is about ESG, okay? So right now the ESG agenda is a big deal in the whole of mining. And it is also in small scale mining. We, therefore, if we don't put absolute priority on ESG actions in small scale mining, 
the, se the small scale mining sector will not be able to contribute with what has to contribute in this century, okay? So we have to make a collective uh, effort with small scale mining operators, with other players in that sector. So we, 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 we include the ESG agenda in all, this, uh, all the decision making within the sector. But we still have two additional indicators for this decade. And I keep on telling this to the mining, small scale mining operators. Uh, COP26, we recently had that last year. And we put two scopes of decarbonation that have to be met within this decade. And here in Brazil, this, this the, the, the commitment is to reduce uh, GHG emissions by 50% within this decade, okay? And how can mining and small scale mining contribute on that? Well, you see that in terms of uh, unit operations, you have, you know, you have lots of diesel oil still being used there. So the, 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 like the priority, the action should be taken in these op uh, unit operations that still use lots of uh, fossil fuel, okay? Because that by doing that, we will be contributing to the 2030 agenda and to the ESG agenda at the same time, okay? My, my view on this, okay? How, how are we doing? How, how are we doing in terms of ESG in small scale mining? Well, environmentally, we have lots to improve, okay? There is lots to be done, okay? And, and the, the, the operators should understand their role and how important it is to look after the territories and look after the future use, okay? On the other hand, socially, small scale mining is not doing, doing so bad, right? Because there is a lot of interaction. And I speak that in terms of my experience talking to people in the field with the local communities. They love small scale mining because they bring jobs where they don't have any other option. So socially, in terms of social responsibility is, is doing better than the environment. But what about governance? Well, that's my view. Governance is very small, okay? So there is lots to do in terms of governance. Governance, of course, we have to do in terms of environmental issues, social issues, but governance should be a big, big priority for the small scale mining sector, okay? And are there examples? Yes, good news. I have a number of examples that we are working to get better governance in small scale mining. The bad news is that we don't have time to cover that, but we, we can discuss it further uh, later on, okay? But what I know is to make uh, partnerships stronger, resilient partnerships with cooperatives or associations of miners. Another thing is coexistence business models that is bringing a lot of attention because it's bringing very good results in South America and Africa as well. And also co-management, on the discussions for future use, okay? Mining doesn't know anything, uh, everything about future use. Who, who are involved in future use is the local communities, okay? So let's, let's slide. How do we get there? Talking to the small scale mining operators, okay? Pick a few indicators, not all of them. Pick a few indicators and set targets, okay? Start recording that, start, you know, uh, start discussing those targets, those indicators with all stake stakeholders, and then you control and record them. So you have a better way to communicate with your, with your community, the local communities and all stakeholders involved in that, governmental, environmental, whoever, okay? But then you go as a, as a mining operator, you go with your targets, record them, and controlled, so you, you, you can show what you're doing about ESG, okay? And you share that information with everybody. And remember my, my, my view on this, ESG in small scale mining is not a restriction. If we do it right, we show that ESG in small scale mining is a vocation, okay? So that's the last, last message, guys. Thank you very much. Looking forward for the discussion. Thank you, Lauren.
Thank you so much. Uh, and you're exactly to time. I had, I think, 12 seconds left on my timer. Perfect. <laughs> Um, so again, uh, we can raise hands and I will promote people to speak to ask questions. I'm going to promote Nilvanda Rodriguez right now, followed by Monica Feria. Um, and while I promote you guys and you're getting connected, I'm going to read one of the questions out of the chat. So that'll give everybody a minute to get their cameras and microphones on. Uh, Vania is asking, one of the biggest challenges in ESG adoption is the involvement of the technical staff who need to change the way they operate, adopting practices which are away from their comfort zone. A good example is the mining planning, which is selecting using tools like NPV. The mine plan may not be the best suitable mine plan. Maybe the ESG one is more expensive, for instance. So how do we convince the technical staff to include these ESG criteria in their operational practices? So whoever wants to tackle that uh, can, and I'm gonna promote Novanda and Monica. And after we get the answer to this question, I'll yield the floor to them. Uh, I'm happy to jump in. Um, in 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 our work, it's a, it's a great question because it's really fundamental. And I guess more broadly, it's about how do you help a, a, an organisation uh, uh, revalue uh, activities that have, have often been seen as as a cost. And the old the old story was that as soon as budget needed to be tightened, the sustainable um, stuff was the first to be the first to be cut. Um, uh, but I guess what we've seen in, in our work is that when, uh, say, the sustainability function can be communicating risk in a language that other parts of the business can understand, um, they're much more likely to take action in line with um, uh, what is necessary to control that risk. So using very, you know, technical language, um, for a way, in our case, to be um, uh, promoting and, and developing stronger, deeper relationships with, with community. Um, the other way that I've seen this is, you know, a, a good example is with procurement. So procurement uh, notoriously in, in companies are, are savage. You know, they are just focused on, on the bottom line and getting the best deal. Um, but, uh, but where leaders within the company can say, actually, we can introduce additional criteria for evaluating value um, and, and what cost means now and in the future, um, then procurement um, is able to make decisions that, that have a broader set of criteria other than just um, like of cost. So in both of those cases, it's about um, how do we broaden the conversation within a company uh, beyond uh, the little silos in which they, they get trapped um, uh, typically in one way is through language and, and another is through, I, I think, good leadership in those, in those spaces. Uh, could I add, uh, Florence? Please go ahead. Yeah, what? I'll let Renato add and then Rolf. We, we have to, I think that some of here, I can remember the time of the quality projects there in 1990s, okay? And it was very important that if the company is very transparent, and try to bring everybody in the company to the same objective. Eventually, there will be some, 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 some departments that will go quicker, other than will go slower. But as it is transparent, there is transparency in the in how it's being applied in the company. Certainly, in a in a in a time space, we can certainly align the whole company. So needs transparency in the way that all the departments are engaged. Okay, and either, either the, the, the board, the directory and managers, they have to show that they are also uh, involved. But again, the whole company has to be, uh, the, it needs to be open how each department is getting involved. Yeah, complementing this, uh, all have to understand that ESG and SDG are not more expensive are not additional costs. If you apply it right, it will save money for the company. I remember uh, uh, Avanshub Dev, a, a social scientist from the United Nations, said once that it's difficult to measure the investments in social environmental management. But for sure, for sure, it's much cheaper than the cost of a crisis. So this 
the, the, the people in the, inside the companies and all of them have to understand. Wonderful. Um, unfortunately, I think we lost our first question from Nilda. So I'm going to go ahead and ask Monica to uh, unmute and if she's comfortable, you know, connect your camera and ask your question. And after her, we'll go to Francisco. Well, we'll take answers from the panel and, and then we'll go to Francisco. Hello, everyone. Uh, I have a question. How to convince this kind of mining companies to change their old concepts and look for the targets of 2030 agenda. Because in practice, we have a, a problems with the cosmetics and superficial sustainable development goals application in some mining companies. That's it, thank you. Anyone who wants to begin answering that question, just jump in. <laughs> uh, well, I'll do it again, I'll jump in. Um, well, uh, my sense is we we need to come at the issue from from every direction we can think of all at once, and uh, and to to provide the tools for both rewarding and uh, I guess publicly um, revealing those companies that are not doing a great job or acting in a cosmetic way in in these areas. So, um, you know, I think. Uh, I think this is where ESG is so interesting and promising, but also it's at such a critical moment that uh, those of us with a with a passion, with an interest, and with technical uh, you know expertise in those spaces should be getting in and helping to define what successful activity and practice in those spaces looks like, and not leaving it no disrespect to, to lawyers to define what good community relations looks like, you know, um, and uh, and to really try and win that argument because we're trying to win the future, right? Um, and then uh, uh, f from, from revealing um, uh, company activity there, I think larger activities are required where we aggregate knowledge and, and data to, to show those companies that are doing well and those that are not doing well and those that are on the journey um, and, uh, uh, and to allow the market to differentiate um, and to reward those companies with cheaper capital, with, with cheaper insurance, with you know, with, with better human resources, because workforce, because people want to go and work for companies that are making real progress in these in these areas. So, so actually, I think we need to try and win all the battles all at once. And there's plenty of us working in lots of different spaces to, to be doing that, um, uh, but, uh, but needing to approach it with clear eyes, um, uh, with, with what is at stake if we're not to achieve those goals. All right. Yep, go ahead. I was going to say, if anybody has anything to add, jump uh, in. To compliment. Well, we have to understand that mining companies are dominated by geologists, engineers, financial professionals. And, and in some companies, it's too much dominance of this sector, of these professions. And it's and taking the, the presentation by, by Kieran, by making the risk accountable, okay, quantitative, Certainly, it will be much easier uh, to, to bring these people on board, to understand that there is a, 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 a number for the risk there, and certainly they would understand better. So the cosmetic will, will, will lose uh, when they are faced to the, the, the quantitative reviews. No one else has something to add. We'll uh, ask Francisco to please go ahead and unmute yourself. And if you're comfortable, turn on your camera, uh, please ask your question. And a heads up to Richard Sam, I'm gonna promote you as a, a panelist. So you'll be next after Francisco, but Francisco, please go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, uh, thanks very much for this opportunity. First, let me compliment the panelists. You gave excellent talks. And uh, it is nice to see the progress, but uh, I'd like just to, and not being provocative, but I know that I will be, uh, but this is not my intention. Anyway, uh, my point is, I think it's still too short time 
for us to be using the expression sustainable mining territories. And why I'm saying that, it's because it's very recently that we uh, heard and these talks today, we've heard of that, and I'm very glad of that. We heard on communication and shared information. This is not the case in several uh, examples. And I don't want just to focus on the Brazilian cases, but of course, I will use this as a case for this, my uh, suggestion and for my question. Uh, I think we are still in a very infancy of the idea of sustainable mining territories. We have indeed to understand the combination of SDD, SDGs and the ESGs as it was said today. And, uh, but why I ask it to make this question is because I think we started doing something from the right uh, angle. And this is basically sustainable uh, communication and shared information. But not being uh, provocative, we have perhaps the idea why we say too often sustainable mining is because we have been thinking too much in compensation and perhaps less in restoration. I'd like to hear uh, from you about this point. Thank you. And again, thanks very much for this opportunity. Anyone again who wants to start with the uh, reflections on this? I don't know, Renato, maybe since we mentioned Better Brazil you, as a uh, specific <laughs> example. I was I was expecting that Rolf would 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 uh, answer, but uh, uh, Chico is a good friend. Francisco is a good friend. But we the idea of proposing, in fact, sustainable uh, mining territory that's a, that's a challenge that that's uh, uh, for the future. We know that, and I, I mentioned that if we if there is no effort uh, by government by mining companies. To, to, to create the conditions for, 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 for accelerating sustainability in the mining territories, we won't reach that, okay? In fact, uh, the mining companies that don't concern with the engagement of the mining territory acts, in the future, they certainly will be restriction to their objectives, okay? So they won't have success on an ESG or SDG and so social, lies to operate. If they don't, they don't succeed to, to bring the territory actors on board. Otherwise we're just being, uh, there'll be just a, a increasing conflicts. Okay, so it's part of at least my presentation to call that uh, there is a need, it's a, it's a prerequisite to let's say to, to, to establish sustainable mining as a goal, but understanding that we are far away from from accelerating that. Attending uh, Renato's uh, call. Um, that's, uh, I, I have to, to uh, agree partially with Francisco. And um, because we have too, too less understanding, too much greenwashing uh, already in place not only in mining, in all activities. And, uh, but the world is changing and very, is changing very quickly. And uh, to achieve a, a, a better territory management, uh, in addition to understanding, another key point is manage expectations because uh, not well managed expectations bring frustration. And uh, this has to be a focus for the companies that if they frustrate someone, they will have a problem in the near future. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, so we'll ask Richard Sam to come on and connect and make his question. And then I'm going to promote Maria Marquez. I think you're going to get our last question. I have a feeling after Sam's question and yours, we're going to be to time. Uh, Richard, please go ahead. Uh, yes, I want to say thank you for this opportunity. Uh, ESM and actually various you know, the sectors of the country. Uh, I will speak uh, specifically to my context. Uh, so I'm from uh, Liberia, uh, West Africa. Uh, based on the presentation, um, firstly, I'm in a public space, so you may hear some background noise. Uh, the, the presenter talked about environmental issues, which is um, low when it comes to ESM, and which I agree with him, because sometimes um, some of the chemicals, some of these uh, mining companies use, uh, they affect the water bodies of uh, local communities, uh, especially the downstream impact, and also even the deep kind of big holes. And sometimes they need the holes uh, being uh, and backfill. Sometimes the biodiversity and a lot of runoff affects the drinking water of local communities. I will give an example quite recently in my country. There's a company called Bee Mountain. So uh, Bee Mountain imported chemical to use on the mine. And due to my handling of the chemical, the chalk, you know, the, 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 the chalk I was taking, the chemical actually had an accident. And, and local communities had to be relocated. And uh, within the relocation of these local communities, involuntarily, uh, it becomes difficult. Who takes the responsibility? Which big government? But sometimes uh, seeking redress, uh, an emergency situation where communities will have at least their basic needs met. It becomes difficult, and that was the case with, with, with my country. Yeah, and even the pictures you can see are their pictures in the water. I would I would stop there for on the environmental issue. Then it brings me to the social aspect. Uh, the presenter, yes, he said uh, artisanal small scale mining and increased jobs for local communities. He spoke with them, but how sustainable are these jobs? It's it's, it's something uh, we have to look at. And that brings me to our gender, our gender aspect. We have a lot of women that are involved in artisanal uh, small scale mining. We have also a lot of young people. And capacity building, are these women capacity built actually to, to be able to carry out the operations of the small scale mining? And sometimes most, most often on these mining sites, uh, women are exposed uh, and to, to abuses because of the illicit Transaction, they say flow of uh, income, sometimes money laundering. So these are issues actually, I think, uh, needs to be considered. Like, for example, during the pandemic, uh, gender differentiated impacts. And you said the time of the most women were home during the pandemic. Only men had the opportunity to actually work on some of the money sites. Because of that, it reduced the impact, the income of a women led household. So there are a lot of issues we can look at. Governance, the participation, uh, and actually of, of women, of young people. And uh, are they being trained? Are they being offered the technical skills? And when it comes to safety and health issues, are these issues being addressed? Actually, we found most of the in developing countries, we found most women and young people exposed to these kind of challenges. So these are issues actually to be looked at when it comes to my actual my context. So I just want to say thank you. Um, to the panelists, and um, we will seek more when it comes to how we can mainstream our uh, gender and sustainability into our system of small scale money. Thank you, Richard. Any members of our panel want to reflect or respond to any of his comments or queries? Highlighting a number of important issues. Okay. Yeah, no issues. Maybe George could compliment. Um, no, sorry, I was answering a, a, a question here online, so I didn't follow the discussion. So I will not be able to, to compliment, sorry. Well, just to, just to respond there, I think it was really great dis discussion there, a canvassing of, of a whole bunch of, of critical issues. Richard, and, you know, I just pick up one in particular, which is, you know, the commentary around uh, gender and progress in those spaces. And there's another question in the in the feed earlier about 
progress against SDG 8 and meaningful employment and, and work and economic development. And I guess, you know, both of those questions really kind of illustrate that progress um, is is uneven in those spaces. And if you if you look at kind of aggregated or averaged, um, you know, reporting or response you know, progress against some of those issues. Things can can look um, better than they perhaps perhaps are, and mask issues that exist at local scales and issues that are dynamic in their nature. With COVID, as you said, Richard, changing the nature of of some of those relationships overnight and quite dramatically. And I guess this is why, uh, you know, for me, I feel like there is enormous value in in constant um, systematic investigation, understanding of these issues through the eyes of, um, of community members that are experiencing these dynamic changes um, and to make those things visible um, so that, uh, so that we, can, we can develop more flexible, robust ways to, to address that within the SDG framework. So it's a, look, it was just a really great canvassing of um, some, some very big complex issues. Thank you. We'll turn to uh, Maria for our last question to wrap up our session. Uh, please, Maria, feel free to unmute yourself and if you want, connect your camera. Uh, hi, everyone. Can you hear and see me? Uh, we can hear you, but we can't see you. <laughs> Well, I'm clicking on the start video button, but it's not <laughs> working. Okay, I'm sorry but... about that. I'm not sure why that would be funny, but please let's let's go ahead and at least get you an answer to your question. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, so thank you all for the presentations uh, today. They were very insightful. And um, I was wondering if, um, Renato, you talked a little bit about uh, stakeholders and the business ecosystem around mining territories. So um, something that I was wondering is that uh, what is the role of small business and entrepreneurs to empower these mining territories, understanding that we have a whole ecosystem of a bunch of actors that are uh, working towards uh, um, um, well, mining territories and, and a sustainable mining territory. So uh, if you have an insight on this, I would love to hear that. Well, um, maybe it would not be the full answer, but I was thinking uh, before, uh, there is certainly a, a challenge how to, how to bring together uh, actors with different cultures, different challenges, different expectations, Different timing. Uh, so I was, I was uh, one, one, one proposed that we establish, we, we put some effort to bring each domain, okay, like the company's domain, the, the territorial actors' domain, like, com like communities, stakeholders, governance, governance govern government, other, other uh, private sector. Uh, so that each of these segments optimize their own system of governance. So if we don't optimize in each of these segments that before they, they put together, we won't reach success on that. Uh, a lot of mining companies, they still don't have their own governance. A lot of communities, they don't have their own governance. There is a, 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 there is a, a lot of authoritarian profiles in each of the of the systems let's say government uh, communities stakeholders private sector uh, mayors and so on so it won't be it will be impossible okay to converge all the systems uh, to a to a, a to a good governance between them if we don't optimize the governance by itself by each segment so my first uh, each segment uh, make uh, their homework and optimize their own uh, governance and their own uh, uh, consolidation of cultures, understanding each one uh, culture, each one expectation and so on. Fully agreed, Redat. So before we fully wrap up and sign off, 
if anyone on our panel has any additional remarks they would like to make. We've said it all and I know only, it is getting, oh, please roll, please go ahead. Yeah, so only uh, to say that we can extend this panel until tomorrow or next week because the, the uh, it's a it's a fascination to, to to talk and think and learn about this. So I think today was a great day, but one and a half hour is too too less time. Lauren, maybe it would be interesting for people to know the, in the audience that you be informing all of them about the links for the for the for the videos of the whole presentation, and eventually we are going to use this this list to invite for the, the coming uh, webinars, okay? And also for participating of the platform. Yes, exactly. You took all the words out of my mouth, my whole concluding remarks. So uh, thank you so much everyone for joining us. Thank you so much to our wonderful panel. We had fabulous presentations and a very rich discussion, which we hope everybody will want to continue on our platform. After we sign off, uh, probably sometime tomorrow, you'll get an email in your inbox that will include a link to the recording of this webinar, any slides that our panel is comfortable sharing, and a link to join our online platform and discussion forum where we will have ample time to continue this discussion, We'll share future webinars, publications, resources, events. So we hope to see everybody collaborating with us there uh, and advancing the SDGs in mining. Thank you again so much to everyone for joining and again to our wonderful panel. And uh, I wish everybody a great rest of your day in whatever time zone you're in. Thank you, Lauren, you did a great job. Thank you. Thanks.